We are so excited to welcome tonight's speaker. Um, and, I, you know, I just, I just wanted to say, I wanted to open by acknowledging that, you know, as the news cycle continues to horrify and break our hearts with every passing day, I think photography emerges as a powerful tool to generate action, response, and discourse. So I'm, I'm always grateful for your participation, but I'm even more grateful to see everybody that have joined us tonight. Um, and you know, our speaker tonight brings with her a unique perspective to visual storytelling and the driving forces of photography. And tonight she will discuss the important relationships between writers and scribers in light, authors and photographers, we will also hear from her about photographic practice in the context of LA. So it is with great honor that we welcome Shana Nystumbro to us here at LACP. Shana is an art critic, curator, and author based in downtown LA. She's the arts editor for the LA Weekly and a contributor to Flaunt, Art and Cake and Artillery. And basically wherever you turn your head to read something about art, you're gonna read something by Shana for sure. Um, she studied art history at Vassar College. She writes book and catalog essays. She curates and juries exhibitions and is a dedicated Instagram photographer and is the author of an experimental novella that we'll hear more about in just one moment. Um, she speaks at galleries, schools, and cultural institutions nationally and is a co-chair of Art Table's so-called chapter that I'm also very proud to be a part of. Go Art Table. Um, and she's a member of the LA Press Club and sits on the board of Art Chair LA, um, which is the advisory council um, of Building Bridges Art Exchange. So Shana will um, share with us her work and we will then have a Q&A with her. So please drop your questions in the Q&A and we will address them at the end. Shana, thank you for being with us tonight. Gosh, hello. Thank you, Rotem. What a pleasure. Um, and welcome to LACP. And welcome, LACP, to our <laughs> Zoom room. Zoom room, uh, yeah, where the fun happens. Zoom room. Um, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a kind of community. Um, I'm pleased about it. I think um, in some ways, you know, we miss each other in person, and yet the way that it flattens the earth out to include people who literally, for all we know, could be on the other side of the globe. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So yes, community, community it is. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I mean, there's so much to talk about. I mean, we probably, yeah. probably should have recorded our phone call and just played it back. <laughs> I know, I know for sure. You know, I was thinking about that when we were, when we were on the phone, I was like, oh, they would have enjoyed it. But you know, uh, I think maybe a good place to start tonight. I imagine that a lot of, of the people that have joined us are uh, practicing photographers and visual artists. And I'm wondering, maybe we can start with some of the really exciting meeting points between writing in words and writing in light and your collaborations with artists. Um, you and I both got to work with photographers as writers and it's always such a fascinating process. I know our audience and members are very curious about what it means and how it could look like when you work with writers. So maybe we can start by you taking us into this process a little bit. Absolutely, um, thank you. And you know, even that is, there's like five parallel, you know, places that you could start because there are obvious things like, you know, photojournalism where you know that, you know that there's gonna be a story. You may or may not be working with the writer depending on how it's structured um and that's a sort of like straightforward way like words and pictures that's what you would think of a newspaper a magazine mm -hmm. then there are more you know creative um you know poetic things like you know that where you may collaborate together with um a writer or a, a poet specifically or even a playwright in some instances to a performance artist to create a visual uh, analogy to what they are doing in words or text spoken word and and you know and then there's a there's a there's a thing where you're an artist with a body of work and you want a writer to say 
do an introduction that you know explains what your exhibition or your uh, your book is, is about. There are all kinds of incredible cross pollinations between all these different means of storytelling, and I think that by way of sort of answering the question, to my mind, the most exciting thing about mm -hmm. right now are the ways that all of that is getting blurred, right? Absolutely. That these categories between what this is and what that is, and this is how you do that, and this is how you do that, and you're not allowed to have poetry in your journalism, and you know everything has to be new and wrestled to the ground together, that there are so many different ways. And I mean, I just got off a call a couple of hours ago with somebody who is expanding the poetry space in the blockchain mm -hmm. and starting to like figure out how liter literature driven NFT and digital and crypto art culture might look and her collaborations with different kinds of visual artists. And so there's, there's just a lot of exciting um, you know, momentum be between these forms. And I think if you look at basically even Instagram, every platform of communication is built of words and pictures, right? And I know that's kind of like saying water is wet, but <laughs> really think about it, right? Because the world is built of a gajillion things. It's built of trees and birds and what things smell like and who's walking down the street towards you and, you know, what the weather is. And I mean, just pick something. But when you're when you're on here, when you're on the internet, when you're in the cloud of, of any kind, really what you have is is words and pictures. And so all of the different forms that that takes suddenly become much, much more essential when you're dealing with this sort of small flat earth of hmm. the internet or the metaverse. Hmm. So that's, and, you know, and the boundaries between photography and digital art and the ability to animate and what a short film might be based on photography, all of that technology that, you know, you can have right here. You don't need an editing suite anymore. So all those continuums between a still photography and a short film, what that is, all of this stuff is merging together in the most um, chaotic, <laughs> but also unpredictable and frustrating and insane and uh, inspiring really beautiful ways. So I would say like, that's kind of the landscape as I see it is nothing, no idea is like a weird idea anymore. So the idea, but at the same time, the idea of writers and photographers collaborating is like as old as the invention of printing presses and cameras. It, it's a really natural fit. And I think because of exactly what you said that, you know, any, anyone, anyone can claim a storytelling impulse. I mean, I know chefs who's base, who base their practice on storytelling, but there's something inherent about words and photographs that you you know that what you're what you're getting is a story and i think that uh right now in our culture there is a real appetite for stories i think um there have been times in art history when um ideas maybe took precedent Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, ex right, we're exploring new concepts, like what does it mean to be modern or something like that? But now we, and it's, you know, it's been a couple of generations, but even more so people want stories. They want it. They want the story of their families and their ancestry. They want a, a place to speak the truth of their own stories and lived experiences. And people want interviews with artists they want they come to talks with artists they want to know what they want to know who who is making the work and what mm -hmm. what that what that is for them and i i've seen just even over the last 20 years of my career just a, an exponentially increasing appetite for that and for work it, itself 
that is also storytelling based. And I think that um, even in completely constructed studio tableau practice, there's still an element of storytelling inherent in the photographic medium that um, I would say makes it unique. There's, among there's, the there's also something that you're that you're talking about that I would just I just want to tease out a little bit, which is also at the core of any creative practice, which is a relationship. And you spoke a little bit about communication, but there's also that element of a relationship with the person that you're, as a creative person, bringing into the studio in order to work with you. And I'm, and I'm curious a little bit about that process as well. Yeah, and that is so interesting. There's, <laughs> this is going to end up being funny, but it's not my intention to be funny, but I won't be able to help it. So the thing is that um, I personally do not really like collaboration. Like I like to do what I am doing and have it be my thing. That's how, that's just, that's me. It's not like I'm not a team player. I love people, whatever. But to me, I get really protective of mm. my ideas and my aesthetic choices and shit comes to me in a dream or a flash and I'm like no this this is how it was offered to me this is what we're doing and that's fine it's fine but you know the idea of like you know I've been in I've been in like workshop settings where you have to you know do a project together and stuff and it's like a nightmare for me <laughs> so huge respect for anyone who actually enjoys and thrives in a collaborative process, because it can be really emotional, right? Like you're creating something and everything that that means to an artist, and you have a vision that you are pursuing. And a collaboration can expand and inspire, but it can also feel really frustrating. So what we did, and by we, I mean my partner, um, LACP member, photographer, photojournalist, Osteola Repetov, who I'm pretty sure is out there somewhere. Hey, babe. Um, <laughs> shout we out. Did, well, shout out always, always. We did this book together. And I'm, as promised, we're going to use it as a little bit of a case study for a couple of different things tonight. Um, watch out for him, if, like let him, you know, keep, see if he wants to raise his hand at any point, he gets special uh, dispensation in the comments in the welcome <laughs> stage. Sure. If he wants, no pressure. No pressure, so, no, pressure no, pressure, no pressure, but if you want, feel free so this to. This is our book, it's called Zen Psychosis. And it is words by me that are a surrealistic memoir that's based entirely in my dream journal and a suite of about 25 pinhole photographs by Osceola. And I will share, uh, they just put the link in the chat and in one second, um, cause it's hard for me to do two things at once weirdly. So I'm gonna finish my thought and then screen share the pictures. Yeah, please do. Um, how, how this happened is I had written the book and he had begun what has subsequently now become a huge, amazing part of his central practice as a fine art photographer, um, but had begun uh, making these pinhole exposures and exploring that, um, that alternative process medium before we even met each other. We didn't even know each other. And we both had these projects and neither one of them had really gone anywhere. And then we ended up, collating them together and you know that's a process that's like going to Ikea together times a million so you know drink chamomile tea but in all seriousness I think that this I have a theory that the success of that um, uh, project was because we both had work that was fairly fully realized and we were able to just figure out how they fit together the best. Mm -hmm. And rather than co-creating something from ideation through failed experimentation and all of the fraught things that go along with the creative process, 
we did not, we, you know what I mean? So yeah. that I, I to everything else that I said earlier about the ways people can work together, I also really want to put a pin in this idea that it doesn't always have to be new things. And in fact, there is a huge value and a huge potential to bring new life into projects or portfolios that you maybe thought were dead. Maybe they were in the vault. Oh, I made those pictures 10 years ago. What am I gonna do a gallery show of them now? It's, I kind of miss them, but it never went anywhere. Those projects can be these hidden gems that when you meet someone's sister who's an incredible poet or you wind up somewhere and there's a spoken word artist, or you pick up a magazine and you read someone's work about a topic that's salient to you, whether it's ecology or feminism or abstract expressionism, and you think that person really knows what they're talking about and I love their style. Those things exist already in the world and bringing them together might be um, an easier and less and faster and less completely emotionally intense process than the scary idea of pick, finding a collaborator and starting something and building it from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that was kind of where all that was going is that my experience has been beyond the amazing magic of like, you know, what a photo editor and a designer can do to marry words and pictures in a newspaper story or what happens when a photojournalist and the writer do the trip or the adventure or the investigation together and then they're telling the same exact story from two viewpoints that kind of thing it's collaboration but it's also hyper professionalized like those people by that point know what their roles are and so they do them right and there's an editor and it's very structured but this murky world out here of like your idea babies that can be a little bit harder to figure out how how to drive in a new lane, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those, so that's kind of some of what that, uh, some of what I've seen be very um, interesting. I also, you know, for the world and uh, for the world of the hyper analog, I also saw an installation in the LA River where photographers and, uh, and the, the poet Lewis McAdams, the late poet Lewis McAdams, his work was superimposed over, in, over images of the LA River and that was projected onto the riverbanks hmm. of the LA River. And that, so that's photography and poetry and physical time-based experiential uh, mediums. And so there's kind of no limit um, to what, you know, to what can be done uh, in, those, in those senses. But anyway, okay, this is me. I just learned how to screen share properly a minute ago, so. Fingers crossed, everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Let's get it. Let's get in with Jaina into the world of sense psychosis. Boom. Did it work? Oh my God. I you did. Work. Okay. You did it. You so, did it. You totally did it. Uh, I made a, a somewhat clumsy, not in the order that they appear in the book, just in the order that they appear in the folder on my laptop. But of all of the uh, pinhole exposures that Osceola has in and psychosis. And by the way, how this started was this cover image is one of my favorite images of his. And in the very beginning, I said, hey, please let me use this incredible image captured at Union Station on the cover of my book. And he was like, what book? And then the publisher was like, what if? And then it kind of went from there. So like I said, you never know, um, you know, book covers is another thing. Like, it may feel like it's just one image, but it's maybe the most important single image of that writer's career in some ways. So there's a lot of a lot of depth um, and a lot of sort of beautiful, really rich cul-de-sacs um, when you start having these conversations between writers and photographers. So okay, here are some of the images. And what I am not going to do is make you um, listen to a lot of reading from Zen, from Zen Psychosis, but I will just say that um, the book, as I mentioned, is based on my own dream journal. 
And when I say based, I, I don't want to give the impression that it was heavily edited. I basically took names out and I swapped the order to kind of approximate um, an organic kind of narrative arc-ish, or at least vignettes within the memoir. Um, but I didn't change anything. I didn't fictionalize anything. Um, it either was my entire control was basically it's in the book or it's not in the book. Everything that's in there is true. It's something that happened to me, but it was the experiment, the literary experiment for me as the writer was about figuring out if you could successfully tell a story in a memoir like way, get to what you need from a memoir key events of a person's life, um, a sense of their personality and their point of view on the world, you know, those things. If you could get that by examining only the dreams or in other words, only their subconscious life. And I obviously thought the answer was yes. And so that was my uh, plan. And along the way, I wound up thinking a great deal about this idea of what tone a book like that would have because surrealism you can't you kind of can't have surrealism without realism and i know sorry corny art history dad pun but like you need a foundation in something that's recognizable and familiar and just kind of chill and you know ordinary so that you can have this flight of fancy that creates um all of the cognitive dissonance and you know imagination busting imagery of proper surrealism and so the the tone of the book is very matter of fact but the things that happen within the book are crazy like you might experience in a dream and that's how dreams are right you're not like wow this is insane in the dream everything just sort of happens and it's accepted by your subconscious oh, that person was my dad a minute ago, but they're my sister now. And we took this boat and ended up, you know, much closer to the moon than I thought we were ever going to get. And, you know, whatever it is, and it just rolls on. And it has this kind of uh, straightforward, um, fl not flat, but like easy to walk kind of terrain in the in the language and then the crazy amazing stuff is happening and that's what dreams are like and that's what I wanted the words to look like but when it come came time to collaborate with Osceola it turns out he had also had a very long-standing interest in surrealism um, during his time in film school at Duke and at NYU he made films that are undeniably surrealistic and completely fantastic and completely out you just they're they're amazing i think some of them might be online i'm not 100 percent sure but they um if you ever get a chance to see them i re highly recommend it and we and we talked a lot about his own separate completely separate from mine like decades before we knew each other he had a whole universe of thought going about how dreams are depicted in cinema which is kind of the opposite inexplicably or not actually inexplicably. So it goes like this. You have a dream sequence or a flashback in your film. It goes to black and white. It goes wibbly wobbly, spirally wily, and then it goes to black and white. It's out of focus or hypersaturated in color. There's a, it's a little at a weird angle of, uh, you know, there's all, every visual cue you can think of, the filmmaker will differentiate the nature of that reality based on what it looks like, because it's in film, and you can't just sort of have everything look normal, but some stuff's weird with a little label that's like, this is a dream sequence, right? So you need these visual um, shorthands that we've all just kind of agreed upon in our cinematic language of what a dream looks like when in fact, a dream kind of looks like everything else um, except its content for the most part. So that turns out to have been something he was thinking about 
years and years and years ago. And I had been thinking about it, putting this book together 15 years ago. And suddenly we're in this conversation. And he said to me, um, because he at that point was known um, primarily for a couple of series of desert landscapes and also these really beautiful um, window, window compositions. And uh, he said, you know, have you ever seen my pinhole work? And I said, you're what? <laughs> so aside from uh, showing me all of this, he had to explain to me kind of what a pinhole was, which I hadn't thought about like many people since I was a kid, because it's that real simple technology, right? It's literally called a pinhole because in, instead of a lens, you have a tiny little hole. And maybe it's, uh, you know, the aperture of your lensless camera, but when you're a kid, it's literally like a hole in a cardboard box or, you know, it's a very analog, very rudimentary way of making a picture. The problem with which is that it's nearly impossible to control or predict focus and exposure. And so you wind up with these amazing, crazy looking, and even though it's a little bit suspect, as I said a second ago, undeniably, the word for these images is dreamlike for all the reasons that I mentioned before, even though, right. So now we're both just nerding out and we're getting so excited and we can't believe that we have these parallel sets of interests in our backgrounds. And, uh, and that's kind of where all of this, you know, those things all happened and that ended up in this project. And it's such a perfect marriage. So that. Now the work itself um, has really spawned a lot of interesting conversations. Now I'm going to cycle through some of the images um, that are in the book. This one is, I mean, it's my favorite. It's a lot of people's favorite. It's, it's all the things we said, plus just like devastatingly gorgeous, romantic. The work, um, you know, is, this is a good one to pause on for a second as well, because it has these elements of fantasy or imagined environments but it's still photography. And so in, crucially, it's still a real time and place where the photographer, the camera, the subject existed in a time, an external time and place setup. It is therefore equally as, ver you know, equally as re reportative of a version of reality as anything. But the aesthetic choices take away some of that crispness of what you might expect in a more um, documentarian usage of a camera, right? Because, and that's an interesting place to get to with these alternative processes. Because if you accept that the function of a photograph is to show you the world as it is, what does that mean? And there's all kinds of choices that get made where, you know, what day you take your camera out, where you go, what direction you point it in, how you crop, how you frame, everything that you do in post, in processing the film, in post-production, the scale of the print. I mean, everything's a choice, but there's this foundational idea that photography has a direct relationship with the external world of like undeniable fact um, that say, you know, abstract expressionist painting in a hermetic studio does not. And that always must be navigated, even if it's not your goal to make photo documentation. That quality of the photographic medium is always present. And so what I love about Pinhole and some of these alternative processes are the ways that they don't completely blow those functions apart but they add this whole other dimension of experience and imagination and chaos uh, to the process, which, um, which I absolutely love. And I think they, uh, they don't undermine the storytelling element. They, to my, to my mind, they augment it with other kinds of tales about that story. It's energy, a little bit of motion, an impression, rather than information. Those things are also kinds of stories. 
or aspects of the story. And I think work like this. And so when you have a picture like this one that I've paused on, where, where we all know it's a woman in a museum looking at a Rothko, and yet we're thinking about a lot of things in this image besides a woman and a Rothko. We're thinking about, you know, color shifts and values. We're thinking about um, our own experiences in the presence of great works of art. Um, we're thinking about whether this presentation, uh, you know, how it interacts with the presentation of the work itself. I think Rothko in many ways is an ideal subject for this kind of thing because he's already at that place of, you know, the liminal transitions between color fields and pure hues and things like that. So this is, um, this was in contention for the cover as well. Um, these are, uh, again, love, love, there's a whole series of um, neon signs at night, which of course would be the optimum time to do that, where the motion is provided by the walking of the photographer and in some case, and, and his move, his physical movements in the space with the shutter open, right? So Osceola uses the word kinematic because it, even though it's a still image, it captures motion in a filmic way, in a cinematic, micro cinematic kind of way. The image is created by the marriage of the object that's out there by itself already and the actions and choices of the photographer, which every image is, but in works like this, that becomes not only so explicit, but it's almost like the subject. And that's something that um, I've learned about what pinholes can do. Similarly, like we look at this, I feel like I just saw a little movie of what this guy went through. And yet you can barely see his face, but I feel that I know him. So what does an image accomplish even without precision? This is another one that was in contention for the cover, but I love it so much as a wide. It looks good as a vertical crop too, but there's um, that yellow stripe is so strong. It's hard to let go of. Uh, maybe someday we'll do a big giant folio version. Oh gosh, that's embarrassing. It's in the book though. Um, I love this one because the symbolism, I love it because it's so timeless. Uh, that's another thing about these, uh, alternative processes like pinhole, they inexplicably, again, there's that word, although my job is to explain things, have a vintage nostalgic element to them. Why? It's not just the soft focus. Maybe it's the fact that drive-in movies are a thing of, you know, our childhoods, but there are other images where the subject is not as vintage and still you get the sense of nostalgia. And it's, again, I think it's because we've sort of conflated the language of like, my memory is a little fuzzy, a hazy memory with what the cinematic language of somebody trying, remembering something from childhood, but also what photographs looked like 40 years ago, right? Those little square ones we all have of ourselves as kids and the foxing and the light bleeds on the sides and some colors get blown out and some colors get saturated and all of that stuff that was just simply how photography, early color photography tended to look, I think um, all, that all feeds in to it together. And you wind up with every single picture being a formal consideration, but as well, opening up this little kind of pocket universe of stories, because that place obviously has stories. And this place obviously has stories. Uh, what are you entering? It's, if you spend some time, you can kind of figure out that it's a roadway, but it looks like a ticket booth. Maybe it's fortune telling, maybe it's a carnival. It's unclear and super clear at the same time. And again, these are all features, um, same kind of balance between what's clear and what's unclear. And these are all features that I think really uh, make, uh, this is what I was talking about. This is obviously contemporary and it has that same quality and spare thought for the little man down here. I love him and really, really wanna know what he's looking at, thinking about doing there. Um, that's a story. 
a story, you know, maybe you're the one making the story, but if you have, anyway, you get the idea. And so as we moved through selecting works, um, we wanted to have a range of styles. Oh, those are our headshots um, uh, that we did. That's Osceola's self-portrait. That's me up at the Getty Center. Um, classic pinhole exposure, an early, um, one of the most popular ones of this. I'm going to get it wrong because I, I always forget whether it's the third or the sixth street bridge, but I'm pretty sure that it's the sixth street bridge, which is the one that no longer exists, making this even more special um, than it already is as an image. And you start to see. So um, I love these. This is one that um, I'll give you this, I'll give the secret away, it's a crosswalk sign. But this particular image spawned a whole other universe of conversation having to do with abstraction in photography and whether that's even a thing that's possible. Like, does it exist or not? And why and why not? And give me some examples and let's get in an argument about it. And never find, never resolve the question, which is part of what makes it so exciting is that it's maybe fundamentally unresolvable. But this idea of, you know, as a photographer keying off the world, is it semantically possible, like definitionally possible to make an abstract image? You can make an image that presents as abstract as this one does, but if you want to get into like whether it is, and then what the meaning of is, is, sorry, then that is to me fascinating and a conversation that can go around and around uh, forever. And it already has done in generations of art history. And I think is one of the more uh, interesting threads to kind of pull on, um, to unravel when we speak about the world of photography is this idea of of abstraction and what it is and how it's achieved. Is it through, pro is it a function of scale, cropping, you know, what, what does it mean to be a photographer who works abstractly? Then there's cameraless photography and there's all these other amazing alternative processes that kind of spin out where the properties of the, photographic technology and materials and mediums itself and their behavior is the subject of the image. You might be able to convince me that's an abstract photograph, you know, but that's an argument that, you know, I, that I love, that I'll have with, that I love, an argument's the wrong word. That's a discourse that I think um, is nowhere near done yielding its fruits, especially as we enter into uh, an increasingly digital world where increasingly any sort of anything goes. That, that might be something that it's worth putting a pin in and having a conversation that's like a panel of photographic practitioners weigh in because that's something that um, I just find endlessly fascinating. And anyway, this is the exact image that gave, that gave rise to that consideration. Uh, that's the one. Um, obviously that made it onto the cover. Um, and I love it. I love it because even before I was told that it was Union Station, you knew that it was a place of arrivals and departures. Um, I love the approximation of magic hour in the color, in the light. I love the idea that you're going through a portal and there is this whole white light world outside and it's known or known only to the figure it's certainly unknown to the to the viewer and uh and yet you know this was something that was a daily occurrence at an architecturally significant train station you know a mile from where we live like kind of no big deal right and yet this image has every conversation you want to have about photography tucked inside of it I think it's a real masterpiece so that's the one that ended up on the cover of the book, there we are, and there it is. Uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing now in case Rota might have anything to add to help me kind of pull uh, stuff out of that. I, I have know, I've been so talking many questions. for about half an hour. 
no, so no, gonna... no it's, it, it felt like a minute because um, it was so striking to see these images with you. Um, so let me ask you something. Um, as you were, there, there's a couple of things that I want to name in what you were just talking yeah. about. Um, you know, you need to find the right partner to bring an existing idea to life. Um, and it really struck me in how you were able to create those meeting points between both of your projects. And I thought, you know, the way you were talking about earlier in terms of bringing a ready project, like something that was, or, that you already wrestled with for a while to bring that into the conversation. Um, it's such a powerful thing. And I, and I just want to make sure that we name it um, because then it kind of opens up the possibility as you were talking about to have the idea of a creative collaboration as a way to navigate concepts and challenge shared realities. So I thought that was very powerful. And one of those things that you don't really think about during the creative process, yeah. but when you're wondering as a photographer, like, how do I start, like, how do I engage a writer in my work? I think it's really helpful to think about it in this way. Yeah, I think so, because what you're really wanting to engage are your ideas, right? In a sense, I mean, aesthetics are, you know, style, but all of that kind of as a package, like what's important to you as an artist and what's important to you as a writer, mm -hmm. even though you do your activities in different mediums, you have these things that at the core you both think about. And when those things are shared, then you have this kind of marriage of tonality where yeah. you can bring the, you know, you can bring the projects together. And like I said, I mean, if I'm a gallery and, you know, you're like, I made this amazing work in 2007. Yeah. I'd be like, it, if it's not the most amazing thing I've ever seen, why would I show 15 year old work when you have new work? That's also amazing. So where does yeah. that live? But if you're in the context of something like a book, then it's like, I made this work 25 years ago and everybody goes, oh, wow, that's so interesting, right? There's no, like, what do you mean it's not new? There's no, there's no, there's nothing about that in the, in, in that kind of context. Um, yeah. In fact, it's a more interesting aspect of the story. Like this has been stewing on the proverbial back burner since before I even moved to LA or something like that then it's like, that's fascinating. And that absolutely in a meta story becomes part of it. Uh, whereas, like I said, when you're kind of like walking into a gallery, they want to, for the most part, see what you're doing now, which makes sense. But then what do you do? And so this, this kind of thing has a huge potential uh, practical application to revive um, your favorite projects from the past and give them a new life. Ooh, Osceola raised his hand. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. I don't know if we can if we can see Osceola, but but uh, wait. I mean, let's do see. it. Let's see. Let's see. Attendees, I bet we can. Let's, let's allowed uh, to talk. Okay, babe, oh. I got you. I got your allowed <laughs> to talk button on. There he is. Hello, Osceola. Hi, everyone. Uh, I really Hello. should have read the um, the uh, synopsis of what we were going to talk about as a LACP LA. Uh, PC member, I should have, um, I should have, uh, I was planning to listen anyway, and I thought that Shana was uh, mediating a conversation about photography. I had no idea it was about the book, so I am Surprise. pleasant. Yes. <laughs> okay, in my defense, you were in Chicago, and I didn't want to burden you. Guys, you're, you're getting a, 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 like a sneak preview into really behind the scenes here. But wait, Osiola, um, we would love to hear, you know, now that we are talking about the book, and we are talking about the working relationships between photographers and writers. Um, we'd love to, to hear a little bit about your perspective on this and if you have any, any thoughts about that as well. Yeah, well, um, as a photographer, it's always great to uh, collaborate with a writer, especially a really good one. Um, I have slightly different memory of how this all began. Um, I remember uh, Shana mentioning that she had written a novella and that no one had really seen it. And I encouraged her to let me look at it. And she mentioned at the time that I was only the second or third person who'd read it. That's and, true. 
my um, my my immediate reaction was this is a wonderful uh, piece of writing and um, we really need to look into getting this um, published so that more people could look at it. And I feel like in part because uh, Shana, um, most of her practice relates to film, I mean, to art criticism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. She didn't really, I think, feel maybe comfortable or wasn't her first thought to publish a work of fiction. And uh, it's similar to me. I, I had been, you know, making these pinhole photographs for some period of time, but um, I felt um, when we first started discussing it that it was more important to show my my more realistic photographs first, and that uh, showing blurry photographs early on in my career could be a mistake. And she encouraged me to, um, to, you know, put those out in the world as well. So that, that that's how I remember it coming together. Mm. That's that's really interesting because that that kind of ties into another question that I've had that I think is more of the photo historian, art histor historian perspective, um, which is the framing conditions of the images. I think it, there's, you know, Shana was talking a little bit about that idea when it comes to the text, but it's also really relevant for the images, meaning you created the images to maybe be shown or experienced or viewed in a certain context. And by creating a collaboration like that, you're kind of changing the meanings and appearances of these images in the world. And, and I'm wondering if, you know, during the creative process, how did that come into play? Did you guys discuss it while working together? Well, I think one of the great things about photography is that books are a really great facsimile of what the actual photographs look like. More than any other art form, I think, you can really get an excellent uh, appreciation of what the print might look like, the final quote unquote artwork would look like by just holding a book in your hands. And that's something, you know, very special to celebrate about photography. Um, so, um, but I think that uh, another aspect of putting in a book is it does, it, you know, relating them to a story definitely cre creates a contextualization that's different from anything that I imagined when I originally made the images. I think it's really interesting um, that the two um, parallel art projects sort of exist together and apart in the sense that since they weren't created as a single work and yeah. were two, you know, fully realized work when they were brought together, it sort of brings a lot of, uh, I guess, um, chance uh, relationships or uh, fortuitous, um, mm -hmm. it's random, uh, changes to, to each of them. And I feel like um, that's largely also relates to what she was trying to create with the writing and what I was trying to create with the, the photographs. And as far as the photographs are concerned, um, you know, pinhole photography uh, has a lot of different uh, variations and it is uh, technically possible to, to guess what the exposure will be and to create sharp images. But in my case, I use the pinhole as a sort of an extreme version of a neutral density filter, basically as a way mm -hmm. to significantly elongate the exposures that are required. And that uh, puts uh, the images that are captured into uh, a place where they, they are more similar to film in terms of like the amount of time that they represent, usually between like five and 30 seconds. And, um, and also it introduced the blurriness that if you, um, if you have a, a, a well-formed pinhole, like an accurately formed perfectly circular pinhole and you put that on a tripod or something that doesn't move, you can get a very sharp image. But that was uh, not what I was looking for here. What I'm really looking for here is a way to um, to take long exposures. Fantastic. So we have this expanded more experience of time through the writing itself with the surrealist dimensions and the dream um, experience of the words, but then also the images themselves that take us on a different journey through their um, expanded notion of time. Thank you so much, Osceola. We got a double, double feature, I love this. Um, um, Shana, I wanna ask you something else about working with artists and working with photographers as a writer. Are there any do's and don'ts? Is there something that our folks here as photographers who want to work with writers should be aware of to do or not to do? Um, insert your own joke about writers' egos here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. 
I mean, you know, again, this is part of the reason, like, there's so many different versions of this, right? Because, like, I work with photographers like any other artist to do, like, you know, a catalog essay or an exhibition statement or something like that. And then there's a part of it that's, like, it needs, you know, my writing has this functionality and it needs to, like, do, you know, do the things it does and tell your, I'm, te I'm telling your story. But if we're talking about something that's truly, like, two creative parts coming into one creative project, then I would just say um, to be really mindful of the fact that they're equally, they're equally, that you're equally invested in the creative expression of what you're doing. And mm -hmm. that language can be both descriptive and evocative and imprecise and can be used to cloud the picture as well as make it clear. And that everything, every trick you might be pulling out to make your image look exactly the way you want it to, that a writer will have an analog of that within their mm -hmm. practice. And so that it's less about each to each, what like the specific, like nor, never would I say unbidden, like put more blue in that, right? And so you just have to, you just have to treat them as another artist and think about their investment in the project. But for that, you know, clarity of communication from the outset. And I think that my specific advice would be to make the collaboration about the freedom to take independent paths to an agreed upon destination, mm -hmm. rather than being all up in each other's shit every step of the way. <laughs> That's a great advice. And I, I say that advice. from the writer's side. That's <laughs> a great advice. Um, are there any other projects that you currently work on with, with artists that, that um, make another interesting model for this? Yeah, um, there, gosh. Um, I'm working, I just finished working on a catalog essay for a painter that everyone, sorry, I know where we are, but um, that, uh, that everybody in LA loves, uh, Enrique Martinez Celaya. And that, these kinds of, it was for the Museum of, of Art, uh, Monterey Museum of Art. And these kinds of catalogs are really interesting to me because a, a, an institution will tend to publish two or three pieces of writing in a catalog. And each of them has a different thing to do. And I always get the sort of, uh, yeah, but what does it really mean job, right? There's like a, there's like a stately, art historian yeah. who's like putting everything in the context and talking about, you know, Velazquez and Goya and whatever they're doing. And then there's like, you know, and then there's somebody that, you know, is maybe, uh, maybe it's a, a giant poem by, you know, a relevant poet or something, you know, Cheslan Milosh or Robinson Jeffers or something, something that means something to the artist and or some you know something commissioned and then there's me and i'm usually the one in the middle where i have to kind of go all of that is true but here's why it's alive for you today in the modern world and that is actually a much more creative almost like a short almost like a creative writing like almost more like a short story writing kind mm -hmm. of gig because you, what you are doing is you're telling the other the, the, the same story as everybody else but from and the same story that the artist is telling in the work but you're doing it from an almost quasi biographical place at that point so you're literally sort of like here's this guy's life story and here's the story of the world and here's where this art marries those things mm -hmm. and like I said that's almost like something you could imagine reading in a short story in a fiction context um although of course it's all completely true so that that kind of essay is something that I that I really love 
And, uh, and so I just finished, I just finished that. And I finished a similar project with uh, um, uh, an artist, I don't know, is he part of the LACP? C. Fodorenu, is he part of your membership? Anyway, I, I think he might be, might be. But, or maybe, maybe, but um, a photographer who did a book that where the photographs were half photographs that he took at this crazy mythological lake that supposedly has like a dragon in it in Romania where he grew up. It's called the Loch Ness of Transylvania. And he has all these amazing photographs that he took when he was like eight with like his little brownie camera or whatever. Um, and he found them recently. And in the intervening decades, he, be, he grew up to become a photographer. Now he's a professional artist photographer, you know, fine art photographer. And so he took the, his, you know, grown up camera and went back and took more pictures and then made a book project merging those, those series. And again, there were two or three writers involved and I got that middle job, that's my favorite. And, um, and that was something that was really fascinating because it was like the same kind of thing. Like these are 40 year old photographs and they look like that. So they scream nostalgia at you at the top of their lungs. So then what approach do you take to the contemporaneous response to those? Do you try to match that aesthetic? Do you push back? Do you update? Are you telling a story of then, but from now, or are you telling a story of now? And all of the that layers. percolates through your aesthetic and material choices. And, uh, and so that was really fun to pull that apart and to, to kind of get in there and figure out, you know, this kind of like, uh, you know, combination sort of stand by me energy of like, you know, childhood monsters with um, the very serious understanding of like a grown man confronting his family and, you know, ancestry. And so that was a really uh, lovely, lovely way to do it. And that's a project where I really don't think either a written account or mm -hmm. photos without words would get you where you need to be. I think that's a perfect example of where you need both for him to be able to tell that story completely because so much power resides in the, the synchronicities of the explanation. And yet it's all about the images, but you really see what happens when those two things um, are working together towards this yeah. a, a common goal, yeah. I think I think what you're saying here is really important. How uh, both of these creative processes can um, serve one another and amplify one another and elevate one another to tell a more compelling story, and how important it is to find the right people to help you tell that story. I mean, it's um, the person that you choose to bring into your studio to bring into your work um, needs to be able to share a compelling story, and um, it's interesting also what you're saying about being the writer that is being called to do a very specific part in the catalog, because that is how it works behind the scenes. Uh, there's different types of voices and um, um, different types of ways of telling that story. Um, so I think it's interesting for everybody that are here with us that, are, um, that might be photographers or visual artists to think about how those meeting points can help best serve their practice as they move forward. Um, and thank you for dropping a link in the chat for the project. Multitasking, that is incredible. Um, well, I realized I had it open and so I wouldn't have to deviate my attention too much to get it. Yes, so that's Cornell's that's project and it's a beautiful um, little book, so yeah. Fantastic. Um, everybody, you can click on the link and check it out. And you can also see um, a link to uh, Zen Psychosis in the chat as well. So there's one more thing I want to ask you about, which relates to where we are here. I think where we are here right now, which is LA. Um, let's yeah, talk a little are. bit about, yes, let's talk a little bit about photography in this lovely county that we call home. I think. It's a hunch, 
I think there's um, specific qualities or measures of visual storytelling that are uniquely LA. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that as someone who has been observing this scene for so long and has been chronicling everything that is happening here on the ground. Yeah, you know, I think that um, it's funny because you didn't say this, but just saying that the answer always wants to be, well, compared to New York, <laughs> and I don't even know, like, I didn't the mention glitch in my mind is you did not say compare LA to New York. You just said, what's mm-hmm. going on in LA? And I'm like, well, the difference between LA and New York is, right? So why is that? Question mark. I don't know. But <laughs> I will say that I, I think I would, because we talked a little bit about this in the pre pre. I, I actually think that anything you can say about photography in Los Angeles is pretty much identical to what you would say about any f- contemporary art being made in Los Angeles. I think the sensibility mm-hmm. of LA, Southern California, West Coast cuts across photography, painting, sculpture, performance, installation, whatever, um, in a way that really reinforces the kind of regional character of the art history that's unfolded out here, this kind of uh, natural affinity for the, you know, look, if one more artist says, oh my God, the light in LA, but I'm sorry, it's true. It's like, it's true. And every artist, every person, every generation discovers that for themselves when they get off the plane for the first time and they go, oh my God, oh my God. And they live through their first kind of magic hour and they think, what is, what is this? And it's a true phenomenological situation that we have a different relationship to light and outdoor space and the natural world than people who live in other places do. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so of course there are hundreds of artists who have thousands with an incredible profound relationship to our urban centers. And it's not like everyone out here is a landscape photographer that shoots at magic hour. That's not what I mean. But I do, because of course, I think if you back up, it's marginally impossible to say what LA art is either. But I think what is interesting is that um, photography made here is, to my mind, very much in the same pocket as say, for example, the paintings being made here. And I do yeah. think that there is an expansive sense of space and, and light and um, color in many cases. Um, I think there's, you know, obviously color photography, it's not like no one has the lock on color photography, but I, I think that color is, um, is operate you know operational as kind of a function of the appreciation of light and the natural phenomenon of the environment here, um, but we also have a very different relationship to say architecture than mm-hmm. other. There it is. I told there you. It is. There's a light. There's a light. I told you there'd be one siren today. I was like, we've almost. How are we not hearing a helicopter yet? That's what I want there to know. Is. Um, the lovely EMTs don't like my answer. No. Uh, no. No, but you know, we have a very different relationship to architecture here as a culture, like LA's yeah. culture. Um, there's a there's a there's a thing about newness here um, that people that resonates with people in the way that um, oldness in antiquity might resonate in other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, we have a very different relationship to history. We tend to think very much in terms of like our, you know, our family history, maybe the, the history of a neighborhood, right? It's very, it's very intimate. Um, where at, you know, because it's a relatively new place, right? It's one of the yeah. youngest places in one of the youngest countries in the world. And we're only just now as a culture here are beginning to pull things apart about our relationship to the ecology and indigenous peoples and land use and all that, you know, the, like, what does immigration mean when you already stole the land first 
from somebody who stole it from someone else and somebody who stole it from someone else. And by the way, it shouldn't even be the country it is. Like, how do you have a conversation about who belongs, what belongs to whom and who belongs where in a place that's been so contested and passed through so many hands of so many different kinds of colonizers and is still being contested because we're going to have environmental issues that we need yeah. to sort out as a team and we're not addressing that and we have all these social ills that stem from all of that and yet it's one of the most beautiful places in the world and I think the incredible natural beauty and our very um, inconsistent but evolving relationship to history and the fact that this is this, one of those cities that people come to from all over the world. So you have fifth generation Angelinos and new Angelinos every five minutes and it's amazing, right? And so you have, it's a really like, almost like primordial, like we have this incredible culture that's still creating itself in Los Angeles. And, um, I personally feel that the one, the overwhelming defining characteristic is the sort of looming darkness of confronting how Los Angeles came to exist mm -hmm. with the incredible pleasurable beauty of living, living in this part of the world, right? Sunshine and noir. I really think like that's what LA is about. And I think that comes across in all the mediums and photography has, um, played one of the most starring roles in the creation of that identity um hand in hand with hollywood so that mm -hmm. is my that's that's kind of how i think about it and where photography is i think that there's uh whether it's justified or intentional or even what the artist wants there is a resonance with cinema that comes along with using a camera and so i think there might be a little extra juice to the idea of photography Mm -hmm. made in los mm -hmm. angeles because of that as well absolutely yeah. absolutely and and it seems to me like um um photography that is being created here now is as you say it's taking an active part in all of those social issues right in all of those um mutations and shifts and transformations within our local cultures it seems that in la specifically photography is always there to comment and um to you know, help us crystallize the stories that we tell ourselves about our communities um, in a way that is really embedded into the DNA of this place. So I really appreciate how you kind of pull that apart. Thank you, yeah. Because you, know, you think about it a lot, but it's such an elusive idea. Absolutely. And as is a way when, when you see idea. it it's such a pop-out yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, absolutely what do i know yeah <laughs> absolutely um so shayna i want to thank you so so much for being with us tonight and for sharing your work with us in this way for helping us to think a little bit about those complicated relationships between photographers and writers photographers and their studio photographers and the place that they're working in i really appreciate that uh, multi-tiered view and um, thank you for sharing all this. My pleasure. I love photographers. They're my favorite.